Don bought it from me. Hallelujah. day that you've made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to love on you. We're going to just cuddle up next to you. We're going to see how miraculous you really are by your word. Your word comes out, stands out. It is powerful. Oh my, it is It is full of faith, talked up with faith. When we read it, Lord, we just love it. We thank you for your word. It's true. It's powerful, sharper than ever at any two-edged sword is what you said. It's able to get right down to the very bone and the marrow of your being right into it. Bring out the things that you know that we have in us. Lord, we thank you for all those that are here today. Those that aren't able to make it for whatever reason, Lord, we pray blessings on them and their whole household. We thank you for every individual that comes to worship in unison with us and the Lord in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. Thank you for what you've done. Glory be to you, Father. So let's worship him in spirit and in truth. He'll inhabit our praises is what he said. Amen. Let's do it.
Yeah. 
happen when you move. So would you come and move here?
Well, listen. So here's the God that we serve. It says to us, Therefore I tell you, stop being worried or anxious, perpetually uneasy, distracted about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body as to what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Hallelujah. Amen. Therefore, we're going to jump down. Therefore, do not worry or be anxious, permanently uneasy, distracted, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? For the pagans, Gentiles, eagerly seek all these things, but do not worry, for your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But first and most importantly, seek, aim at striving after his kingdom, his righteousness, his way of doing, and, be, and being right, the attitude and character of God, and all these things will be given to you also. Hallelujah. Good word. Good word. Not to be anxious, knowing that he has everything under control. He is our God. He is our God. He is our God. And then he says, ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives and he who keeps on seeking finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, it will be open. Hallelujah. That's something to shout about. That's something to shout about. We're going into a new year. We're wondering, oh, look at what's going on. All the stuff, oh, it's tragic, it's tragic, it's tragic. God knows what he's doing. I promise you, if we stay with him and we don't forget him, and we don't start saying we'll do it on our own, we will be where we need to be when God wants us to be there, and we will be part of what his kingdom is all about and what he wants his kingdom to do, and he will get the glory and the honor. Can I get an amen? Jackie, turn that mic on. Well, this week, us as believers really had a victory. We had a victory yesterday. Hallelujah, we did. We really did. We really did. On the 1159 hour, we had a victory. So I was, with, I was at the lake with the kids, and Joey's my oldest and um, grandson. So I know, you know, he thinks my grandmother's crazy. But that, that's okay. But you know what was so good is I got to tell him all the things God has done in these 40-something years. And I said, let me tell you something. I have a reason to praise him. I said, I've seen him over and over and over and over and over in my life. Hallelujah. I can't sit still. No. He's done too much. This is real. This is real what it he's is doing. Real. And when Jack was up here saying... You know, we won't always want to figure out how God's going to do this political thing, how he's going to do it. But I'm going to tell you one thing about God. Ain't nobody going to get the praise but him. Amen. Trump ain't going to get the praise. No man is going to get the praise. That's right. No Senate, no Congress, no man. He will get the praise. It's he him. Does. And I'm telling you, once we start praising men, we're in trouble. We must praise Hallelujah. him. He must be all to all to all oh. to us. So I watched him take 20 men, 20 brave men and women this week and do something miraculous. So if we'd have got the Senate, if we'd have got everything, it would, the praise would have went to somebody else. But no way, God's not going to do it. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Amen. All he wants us to do is keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep, keep on, on, keep, keep on, on, keep on, keep on, keep on. Keep on, keep on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we got one more big battle, and that's in Arizona. And that's with uh, this cheating in the elections. So Carrie Lake's taking this to the Supreme Court. So um, she's not conceding. She's not conceded. So let's just pray and believe God that let's his do it right will now. Let's do it right now. Let's do it right now. In Jesus' name, we ask you, Father. We thank you for the miraculous that you have done in our nation. We thank you, no matter what the enemy has done. You will raise up a remnant. You always have a remnant. No matter what, Lord, your purposes, your plans will be established, and we trust you, God. 
So, so Lord, we trust you in this thing with it's the Supreme Court. We ask that your hand be upon you know, the members. We ask that you move mightily, Lord God, God, that you visit them with dreams and visions and revelation. And we thank you, God, for what you're doing. We thank you for our nation. We thank you for those that are in affliction, negative or positive. You said for us to pray that we may live a peaceful and godly life. So, Lord, we lift them up to you, and we thank you for the miraculous. We thank you for who really you are, even besides the miraculous who you are, God, and you sent your Son. And we thank you, Lord. Let this congregation praise and worship you with all of our might. We lift you higher. We lift you higher. You are supreme over the Supreme Court. 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 You are supreme. that I want to read and it says why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing the king of the earth set them against the king of the earth and set themselves against uh, uh, Go ahead. Uh, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing saying let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us, from us. he who sits in the heavens shall laugh the Lord shall hold them in derision, and he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill. He sits in the heavens and laughs. Lift your hands up, kids. Our redemption draws nigh, and we are the redeemed of the Lord. So we should be laughing. We need to give a big, deep laugh right now. God is laughing at what's going on. He laughs. He laughs, and we need to be laughing. We are the joy of the world. We said that is our strength. And if we lose our joy, we lose our strength. And so if our God is laughing at what these men are doing, they're mere men. He is God. Laugh. You laugh at everything that goes on. You laugh and you take joy because we win. We are the victors. We victors. So lift up your head. Your Hallelujah. redemption draws nigh because we are redeemed. We are the redeemed of the Lord. We were bought with a special, a precious, precious price. And never let go of that. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And we're laughing with him at these men that think they're better than us and they think they're gods. They're nothing. They're under our feet. They are under our feet. They have no power. Only the power we give them. Don't give them nothing. Nothing. Don't, don't, don't listen to them. Don't, don't, I don't want to even repeat what Hallelujah. they say. It's not worth repeating. We're going to take we the land. We repeat God and let's laugh, y'all. <laughs> Everybody laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. They're nothing. They're nothing. They're nothing. Our God is in Hallelujah. He is. He is. give God the glory and I didn't want any time to go by today and let's not give him the glory for the DeMar Hamlin thing that's going on. I don't know if y'all saw the football player that got hit in the chest and then he just fell backwards like he was dead. He was and dead. They, yeah, that's right. <laughs> 
and they resuscitated him. But we want to give God the glory because you know what? God's using this to bring America together, to be united about yeah. one thing. We're all come together, come together in prayer. And, and prayer. And Father, we lift up Damar to you. And first of all, we give you the glory and the honor and all the praise for what you Hallelujah. have done and the signs and the wonders and the miracles that yes. you're doing in that young man yes, right yes. now. And Father, you brought the church together and the country together in a way that nobody else has been able yes. to do it with this. And so, Father, we thank you for yes, what you're Lord. doing and what you're going to do in the mighty, I mighty believe. name of Jesus. And, amen. Can and, I get an amen? Yeah, and also there was a guy, there was a guy, y'all, that was on one of these networks, these liberal networks. He stopped and he prayed right yeah, there yeah, on the air. Yeah, he was on the air right there when it happened. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for your word is true. You can use, I, I, we've used that analogy morning many times, you know, if you can use a, a jackass or donkey or whatever you want to call it, he can use anybody he wants to use. Amen. He is. He's bigger than all of it. I want to sing that last one again. You're higher and higher and higher. You're higher and higher and higher. You know, you're higher and higher and higher than our thoughts. You're higher and higher than all our ways. You're higher and higher and higher. Higher and higher and higher, Jesus.
Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Help us to be led by your Spirit. thank you and thank you and thank you and thank you and still not be enough enough of what thankfulness why because there's so much to be thankful for there's so much to be thankful for you say well I'm going through some stuff but he'd say hey you're going through it that's a big deal go through it get to the other side a lot of it has to do with how we perceive and look at situations most people want to look at situations in the negative. They just look at the negative, negative, negative. It's all bad, it's all bad, it's all bad. I, I, I just don't, I don't, God didn't build me that way. And I don't believe he built anybody that way. I believe he wants all of us to look at the positive side of what he can do and what he has already done and what he will continue to do. He just said, don't worry, don't fret. What are you talking, what are you getting all worried about? I know you guys have need. I know you need these things. I know you need them. It's not like I don't know it. I know you need them. But don't worry about them because I'm going to give them to you. You're going to get them. Well, that's easier said than done, Lord. Why so? Why so? It's because of the lack of faith. You don't trust me. Be courageous. Cowards won't enter the kingdom of heaven. You have to be courageous. Courageous means you do it afraid, even if you're afraid, you still do what you got to do. Because the enemy would try to come and put fear on us. He will. He tries that. I'm getting old. Oh, I refuse that in Jesus' name. <laughs> I refuse to say I'm getting old. I do not say. I get a guy who calls me up sometimes. He's a good friend. He's, I won't say who it is, but he's, he's a good brother in the Lord. But he used to call me up and he'd say, hey, old man. I said, hey, man, you got the wrong number. He'd call up and say, hey, old man. I said, hey, man, you got the wrong number. And finally, he said, hey, young man. I said, okay, yeah, hey, what's up? <laughs> We're going to talk about some of that. We're going to talk about some of that. We're going to talk about some of that. We're going to talk about that. Because the word is inspired. It, 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 is, it, is, it is powerful. I mean, it, and when you, it's just like these words, when we hear these words. See, words are powerful. The Bible says words are really powerful. The power of life and death is in the tongue. In the tongue. I go around and people tell me all the time, you know, they'll say, well, how are you doing? I said, I'm perfect. And they'll look at me and they'll say, oh, really? Oh, wow, you're perfect. I said, I, I was walking out of a, and see, this is cool about doing this because you can do this anywhere. And so when I was walking out of a carpet place and, some, and this, this little lady, she was getting by, you know, and she had her daughter with her, I guess. And, and so I was opening the door from him and he said, she comes by and she said, so how you doing? Which is cool because, see, most people, don't, just, they just think about themselves. They don't think about anybody else. So they said, well, how you doing? I said, well, I'm perfect. He said, oh, oh, I didn't hurt nobody. Perfect. And so she walks in there, and when she gets in, and she, I said, I step back in the door. I said, you want to know how come I'm perfect? And she goes, well, yeah, how come you're perfect? I said, listen, the Bible says it this way. He says, if a man or a human, if a man can control his tongue or bridle his tongue, let that man consider himself to be a perfect man. So far today, I am perfect. And they laughed laughed and you're just planting seed and it doesn't have to be like Jesus said this about you know you could just be a, just a little bit it could just be something that just get a smile out of somebody just get somebody encouraged change the atmosphere around you 
I love to change the atmosphere. I like to go into places where people are just, eh, and then just come out with stuff, and all of a sudden they're laughing. See, because, because my brother, Calvin, he come up and said to me earlier, he said, well, I was going to say something about you. Call, call you pastor. He said, I was going to call you banana bread or something because my shirt and everything. And I said, you know what? And he said, I just, he said, that makes you laugh. And, and then he said, well, you know, you, laughing's healthy. And I said, yeah, it's like a medicine is what the Bible says, right? It is. And she brings up laughing. And we're talking about laughing. And the atmosphere, and we're laughing. It is like a medicine. It, it, it's a cure for people that are going through stuff that they, they see no joy anywhere. They have no joy. Man, we need to look at it like we can take this thing. In Jesus' name. Well, higher and higher and higher. Stop thinking lower and lower and lower. We lift your name up. We lift your name up. When everything starts looking bad, when everything starts looking, we lift your name up. Oh, it's coming at you. We lift your name up. It's a simple message, but it's powerful. It is. We have an issue in the United Methodist Church where a lot of people are disaffiliating. Over 2,000 churches have disaffiliated with the United Methodist Church because of all the, all the LGBTQ homosexual activity. The things that are taking, they're taking over in some areas. They have. It's not going to get better. It doesn't look like if you look at it in the natural. But God, is, he's going to do something. And I believe he's going to work this thing out to where whatever we're supposed to do. But we're going to have a meeting here um, February the 1st. I believe it's at 6 o'clock. We're going to make sure that everybody, uh, let me make sure I'm right on that. We're going to be meeting with the DS, dis District Superintendent. Um, was it? I'm thinking it was a Thursday. Maybe it was, wait a minute, wait, this is February, yeah. Yeah, here we go. Yes, 6 p.m., February the 1st, that's on a Wednesday. <clears throat> we need to come together. It's going to be, it's called, uh, well, this is like a, a town hall meeting, they're calling it, where the district superintendent's going to come in, and we've had, uh, you know, people coming in to, to share with us some stuff. I've had people calling me about it. But anyway, uh, basically the pros and the cons, and we're going to see where we're at. And then... Once the district superintendent shares with us what this is all about and what you have to do and what's going to take place, and then we'll go and we'll call a, a, a meeting for everybody in the church that wants to come in here. You don't have to be a, a member to be here. We do need to get the word out to maybe some members that still consider themselves members but don't come. We need to try to get the word out to them, and we're going to try to say, send some mail outs out for everybody. It's important that we do that. And then when we, when we set a date to come in back with the DS, they'll do it. we'll do a vote. It's got to be at least two-thirds. You can have, like, mem you don't have to be a member to be in any of it. You just can't vote if you're not a member. And if you want to be a member, let us know so we can go ahead and make sure that you're on that list. <clears throat> and we'll take and uh, do, the, do the principal things that we need to do. But for, for all practical purposes, we need to get you to put that on your calendar. This is an important meeting. It's a very important meeting of the church, completely. You, you, we don't need to take this lightly at all. Yes. Oh, I thought you were just waving your hand for something. Um, so, but we know that God is powerful and that he can do all things. And we know we can do those things through Christ because he says we can. So we're going <clears> to <throat> we're gonna do what he says we need to do in order for us to receive his blessings in, in order for the devourer to be rebuked for our, for our sake. We're going to receive and take and receive the 
his tithes and our offerings unto God. So if you have that in, in place now, Jackie, you got ours? Okay, we're going to lift it up to the Lord and ask him to bless it and multiply it as we do, Father. We ask you, we know you know everything about our finances. You know everything about what's going on in the church. You, uh, we ask that you be in control and not us be in control, that our mind is be like-minded with yours, and that uh, as we give unto the kingdom of God according to your scriptures, that we would be blessed according to your scriptures, and that uh, prosperity would come in Lord God, that you would multiply it, and we praise you and give you the glory because you have set this in your word, and we are obeying your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, what a day that the Lord has made. I don't know about you, but I really, really, truly, I, I just, I don't, I don't have to go by feelings, but I still feel blessed, unbelievably blessed. So, as I, as I started to work on the sermon, I, I was thinking about the new year, and I was thinking about all the stuff, you know, and I didn't really do a sermon for New Year's. Brian had did that, and uh, we've got a timing set up, and I didn't want to get it out of sync, but I wanted to be here, and he did a great job. He did a, I thought he did a wonderful job, and so I wanted to, uh, to elaborate a little bit on that. I want to, I want to, I want to say, what, what are we... What are we looking for in the new year? What is it that we can do in the new year? What is it that the Lord wants us to do and uh, get direction and things? But he, I can tell you, he's already given us direction in his word. See, a, a lot of times, and, and, and you know, we get people that prophesy and prophesy, and that's fine, that's prophesy. Or I'm, let me give you a word, that's fine, okay, okay, but here's the thing. I already have a word. That's what they, we talked about that the other day. So we got a word. What's the word? The word is the word of God. We already got the word. And if they say anything contrary to that word, then we're supposed to count them a curse. We don't care if it's an angel coming, look like an angel of light coming. And they speak anything other than the word of God, then we're supposed to count them as a curse. So we're going to start off, I want to get the scripture opened up to this. There's a couple of scriptures here. I'm going to read the first out of the New King James Version. I'm going to read it out Amplified. i got a couple of ones I want to do that like that because I want, to, I want to show you the Amplified is done in Greek and Hebrew. It's a little more close to it, but I want you to see how, how the words are in, in, in the New King James Version, right? It says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraints, but happy is he who keeps the law. Look at the Amp now. And it says here, it says, where there is no vision, no revelation of God and his word. That's a big difference right there, it seems like. The people are unrestrained. See, it's got to be no revelation of God, not just a revelation of what we're supposed to do, but a revelation of God and his word. The people are unrestrained. But happy and blessed is he who keeps the law of God. Amen? So this passage in Scripture, it's pretty common to people. We've, in this church, I believe that this morning, everybody's probably heard this Scripture, and, and I believe that we all understand the value of that faith has in our relationship with God. <clears throat> Excuse me. See, the faith that, 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 that takes, it, uh, takes what it takes to overcome even some of the, the, the most unreal things that we're going through, the insurmountable odds that are against us. When you look at the, what's going on in the whole global scope and everything, it just looks like we're doomed. They may be doomed. We're not doomed. We need to get on the right side of this. Can I get an amen? amen. See, it's not, you say, well, with faith, I got faith. I said, well, it's not just faith that we need to have in our, I'd like to, bow, shoot, I was showing the kids how to, how, you know, shooting the bow and everything, sitting out there, and we got them out there, and they, 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 they do good, they really do good. And you got your quiver, and you got your arrows in it, you know, and that's what you got, you got, oh, I got a bunch, as long as I got some arrows, I, I'm safe. Well, see, we need to look at some other things that can make, what, when we go through these trials and these things, that, the, that, that other elements that we can be looking at that God is looking for, because there is faith, but there's some other things. And I'm going to read this out also. I'm, first, I'm going to read it out of the King James Version, which is the one that I don't like to read very much. 
but I'm going to read it out of New King James Version, and then I'm going to read it out of AMP. And you, you, you tell me which one you think brings it home. <laughs> okay, in, in, in King James Version, in 1 Corinthians 13, 12 through 13, it says, for, we, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now if you stop right there, can you digest that and come up with a, a revelation of what that actually means? It might take you a little bit. It might take you a little bit. But then read it. Okay, so they tried to, they tried to, tried to New King James tried to make it where it's a little bit more readable and understandable. So read it at a New King James Version. It says, uh, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Not much difference. But now let's read it in the, in the Amplified. For now... In this time of imperfection, come on, we see in a mirror dimly a blurred reflection, a riddle, an enigma. But then when, we, when the time of perfection comes, Jesus, we will see reality face to face with Jesus. I know, now I know in part, just in fragments, right now I don't see it all, but then I will know fully just as I have been fully known by God. Does that make it a little more clear? I think so. And verse 13, and now there remains faith, abiding trust in God. That means you got to keep on trusting in God. Yeah. Abiding trust in God and his promises. See, if he gives you a promise, you better take it to the bank. Abiding trust in his promises. Hope, confident expectations of eternal salvation. That's our hope. Expectations of eternal salvation. Love, unselfish love for others growing out of God's love for me. I can't love you unless God, I know how God loves me. These three, the choice, the choicest grace, in other words, these are the good ones, these are all three choices, but the greatest of all these is love. So here we see some of the elements that we need to add to Christian walk that are vital, absolutely vital to our survival. We can't just say, well, I got faith. I got faith. We're going to read the word. Say, well, you, got, you, need to have, you need to have faith, hope, love. You need to have all that. This is all one. You consider, look, th these three things, are, they're, they're so tightly woven together, interwoven together that you can't hardly tell them the, the part almost, but <clears throat> they work together. And then they work together as one when they face adversity. When you come to a place where you're coming into adversity, you're going to need all these. You are. We are. So I want you to consider the story of faith. I mean, we're going to talk about some faith here. I'm going to consider some of faith and hope <clears throat> that is shared with us in the, uh, the, uh, the book of Numbers. And it was a, a time of great promise. It was not only a great promise, but it was also a time of great trial for the children of God. And despite the overwhelming negative reports that were coming to, to them, in that crowd, there was, in that crowd for that day, there was this. There was two, two men that would refuse, refuse to lose hope for what God had already told them and what he'd already promised them. Joshua and Caleb. So God, here's what happened. So God, had, he, had, he had sent a select army. He said, okay, you guys, I want you guys to go in there into the promised land of spies and spy it out. And he wanted to determine... Uh, the correction, the correct approach for uh, taking full possession. They're going there. Once you check it out, find out what we got to do. Let's see what you're going to do to take it over. And uh, and among those, there were 12 men that were only out of those 12 men. There was only two of them that you know the story. That was that saw the possibilities of what God had told them. The other ones were different. So we pick up the reading where uh, they had returned, uh, each one of them given their report and everything. Most of them was negative, I can tell you. They were negative. However, there were some that would, uh, you know, be standing sperm and still of what they believed. And he began to share the vision of what um, he, 
thought God wanted. Here's one that's, that shared a vision. This, this is a report. In Numbers, let's go to that. Numbers uh, 13, 27 through 33. Thank you. This is in the amp. It says, they reported to Moses and said, we went in to the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Now, a little side note on that. I dug around a little bit. got a side note. It says, this phrase refers to the abundance of fertility, uh, fertility of the land of Canaan, milk and honey. Milk typically that of goats and sheep was associated with abundance. Honey referred mainly to syrup made from dates or grapes and was uh, and was the epitome of sweetness, is what it says. So it was the epitome of sweetness. But it says, however, bees' honey was very rare and was considered the choicest of food. So that when they went out to spy it out, they found this place is, man, this place has got the good stuff. It's got the good stuff. In verse 28, though, it says this. We on it? Yeah. But the people who lived in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified walled and very large. Moreover, when we saw their descendants of Anak, people of great stature and courage, another footnote, the spies probably had not seen walled cities before having lived their childhood in Goshen and Egypt. Those who forgot God's power to help them naturally found the situation formidable, if not impossible. So these, these guys got in there, and they looked at this situation. They'd never seen anything like it. And all of a sudden, they're looking at this situation saying, there is no way. So let's look at verse, verse uh, uh, 29 of Numbers, 13, chapter 13, 29. It says, the people descend, uh, descended from uh, Amec, uh, Amec, Amecula. How is it? Amalek. Amalek, that's it. I, I, I studied these things, had them down, I'm going to get them. Amalek. They lived in the land of Negev, south country of the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites lived in the hill country, and the Canaanites lived by the Dead Sea and along the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people but before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession of it, for we will certainly conquer it. I love that right there. You know, he's thinking, well, no, hey, look. Now, quiet down, quiet down. Everybody's getting all, all the ribbon roar. We can't take them. They're all worried. They're all fretting. They're all doing it. And here Caleb says, no, hey, wait, 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 wait. come on, come on. Listen, we can take them. We can take them. Jackie's looking at all these dogs and comes up talking about a dog. I told her, she done already told me one time now. You guys, you guys knew this. She said, if she ever decides to get another dog, I'm supposed to be able to kick her right, you know where. And so uh, I, it's not working. It's not working. So she's been looking at all these dog things and everything and everything. And I see sometimes we see some of these, they had some dogs to see how, who was the baddest dogs and who was, who was the ones that would protect you. And all of a sudden, you get these big dogs and they're running away, they're doing this. And you get these little, old, it's like little chihuahuas and like that, you know, and all of a sudden they come, and they're yapping at them, yapping at them. And the guy's trying to make it look like he's hurting the person. And they, they run off, but these dogs, they just keep coming at them, man. And I'm looking at them, and it's like that. And you see them, you know, it's, it's like, I can take them, man, I can take them. He's just a little, he's going to take them. They don't know their size, do they? See, they don't know the size. You can see, well, he, he just thinks he's bad. He does. You know the old saying. It's not how big the dog's in the fight, it's how big the fight's in the dog. Sometimes you have big dogs that don't have any fight in them. So here we go. Um, so then Caleb quieted the people before Moses, and he said, let us go up and at once. He's like, ready now. Let's do it now. Let's go up at once and take possession of it, for we, are cert we will certainly conquer it. We'll take it. But the men who had gone up with him said, oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, oh. we are not able to go up against the people of Canaan for this. And they are too strong for us, I'm telling you. So they gave the Israelites a bad report about the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we went into spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. It eats them up, man. And all the people that we saw in, the, in it are men of, man, they're huge, great stature. There we saw the Nephilims, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilims, 
And we were like grasshoppers in their own sight, in their own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now, so they're looking at, we were, we were looking at ourselves as grasshoppers, and they're telling them, they're looking at us as grasshoppers. That's the problem. We look at situations and we just say, oh, it's too big for us. Well, it's not who too big. You're not the one that's fighting. You got to stand. Now, if God says go fight, go fight. So here it is. So in the face of these negative, all this negative reports, Caleb understood the promise that God had said that he believed. This is what he believed. Caleb believed that with all his heart that he could go uh, and he could go and do what God had fully told him to do to take possession of it. He said, go take possession of it. So we read in, in, in Numbers 14, 24 in the app, just the next one down. But my servant Caleb, listen to this, because he has a different spirit. Come on. He has a different spirit and has followed me fully. I will bring into the land into which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession. Come on, Rama. I got one guy that has a different spirit. Tell me that's good. That is good. I want a different spirit, Lord. I want a spirit that you say I can do it. I can do it. So we know how the story goes, you know. More than, here's what happened, more than four decades. Think about it, four decades, okay, before Caleb was ever able to track, go back up that mountain, that same mountain, and take possession of his promises. He, you know, before he could do that, but what he had to face, he had to face all this opposition. But in all this opposition, everybody telling him he couldn't do it. Nobody, you can't do it, you can't do it, we can't do it, we're grasshoppers, we can't do it. In all this opposition, here's what happened. The fact is that he did not lose faith. He never lost faith. He had hope for the future, even though it was happening. And so here it is, four decades later, he's still having, he's still having this faith and hope of the future. He has not given up. Hey, man, next day we give up because we didn't get it that day. Come on. No, I, I, I'm, you know, I've been trying to pay my house off for 30 years. Well, get it done. You're still, you got up this morning. Keep shooting for it. I won't go into all that. <laughs> Keep your eye on the ball, Zach. <laughs> let's, let's turn to Joshua, uh, Joshua 14, 6 through 12 now. So here's what it is. Then the, then the tribe of the son of Judah approached, and this is kind of approached Joshua in Gilgal, and, and Caleb, the son of Jephunim, the Kenazite, we're, good, we're doing the best we can, said to him, why can't he just make it? And, and they went up to the son of David and sought with Bill, and, and James showed up, and no, he's got to be, <laughs> but that's God's word, man. Okay. Here it is. Moses, the man of God, concerned, he said, what do I want to say? You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning me and you at Kadesh Bar, Neah. I was 40 years old when Moses, listen, he was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Bar, Neah, to scout the land of Canaan. And I brought a report back to him as it was in my heart. It's got to start somewhere. It's got to start somewhere. It may start in a thought. But once it gets in the heart, gee, it's over with. My brothers, fellow spies who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord my God completely. Just two guys. Just two guys. So Moses swore an oath. Moses, okay, I'm going to swear an oath to me. He swore an oath to me on that day saying, Be assured that the land on which your foot has walked will be an inheritance to you and to your children always because you have followed the Lord my God completely. Do you know how much you, how many of you want to see good for your children? 
Well, you need to stand now to do that. You can't just waver and falter and say, oh, I'll give up, I'm quitting because everything. Oh, that's a, forget that mess. Verse, verse 10, it says, And now look, the Lord has let me live just as he said these 45 years since the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now look at me, look at me, look, look at me. I'm 85 years old today. I'm still as strong today as I was the day Moses sent me up, sent me as my strength was then. So in my strength now for the war and for going out and coming in, so now give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke that day. For you heard on that day that the giant like Anakim were there and the great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Now listen, he's saying to, uh, I'm, I'm 45 years, I'm 40 years old. I'm now 45 years later. Now I'm 85 years old. Don't be saying I'm too old to do this. Stop that mess. Don't be saying that. You get what you say in a lot of cases because it starts there. If a man can bridle his tongue, let that man consider himself to be a perfect man. That means shut up when you're talking negative. But it is right. No, I don't think that way. Jackie can tell you, I don't think that way. I don't think that way. I don't look at how old I'm getting. I look, I th so I say, man, it's been a long time. It's, we've been, this has been, boy, it seems like, it seems like a short time that we've been on this earth. I'm thinking, man, it feels long to me. I look at things that I've done in my life. I said, that, that took some time. That was a lot of stuff. The man waited 45 years before he could finally get to do what God told him to do. He didn't fail from his promise of what God's word did. He didn't, he didn't falter on that. He didn't give up. He didn't quit. See, we, we see in this, in this scripture the tremendous power that we have when we can maintain hope of the future. You're thinking about your children, your grandchildren, aren't you? Amen. I'm going to tell you a story about that happened several, several years ago. In uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, there was, a plan, uh, there was a plan put in motion to make this reservoir that, the, that, the wood, that, that would later become known as the Barren River Reservoir, okay? And so they had these plans. We're in their infancy stage of, you know, getting them together and seeing what they could do. The men and women that were involved, they designed the construction, were busy attempting to determine what it was and where, you know, it's, we're looking at all this stuff. We've got to see where we gonna, where's all this water going to go? If once we build this dam, it's, we're, we're backing water up. We've got to see where it's going to end up. So they, uh, they carefully, they, they studied these topographical photos attempting to determine exactly where that water would go. And not only that, but what kind of land mass this project would demand. You know, how much land is this, for us to stop this water flow and get it up, how far is it going to go, how high is it going to rise, and where is it going to end up, how big a land mass do we need? So they did all that, all that, and after careful consideration of these studies, what they did is they began to go from house to house in an attempt to, to purchase the land um, where this reservoir was going to be affecting. So while they were... Some of the people that they came to, they sold the house immediately. They, were, they sold out right now. Oh, yeah, I'll sell out now. And so there was others that were more determined to keep their property. I'd be probably one of those. More determined to keep their property and refused to sell the land. They just did. But much after, you know, there was a lot going on. Much of this was farmland that had been in people's family for generations. And the family just, you know, they had a hard time. This was very, very... It was a big decision for them. It's extremely difficult. However, it was only a matter of time until after a while you could kind of ride around the whole countryside. And when you rode around the countryside, you could start to visually see and determine which families sold out versus which ones decided to keep it. Now, how can you do that? How can you just drive around and look and see well, this one sold out. You don't know. How do you know they sold out? Well, here's how they knew they sold out. To those who had made deals that would eventually relocate their family 
You could see where the fences were, were soon needing repair. You could see where the, the gates had fell and were shifted and they were, they were falling down almost. You could see the barns, they weren't kept up. The price, the, the, they used to be in prime condition and now they're looking really dingy and looking just needing repair. And it became very obvious that those once proud land farm owners had the feeling that there was no need to fix them up. Why should we do that? Because soon they're all later going to be underwater. So I could get that. I, can, I understand that. You could probably do that. But when you do that, here's what happens. You don't know what's going to happen. See, because here's what happens. I want you to hear this. Where there is no faith for the future, there's no power for the present. You'll stop, you'll stop dreaming. You'll stop getting a revelation of what God will. You'll just stop because you're just done. You might think, well, I got my little nest egg. You don't know. You might die. No faith for the future. No power in the present. We want power every day that we're on this earth. See, once they lost hope, and having the crop in the field and all that, it wasn't long after that they expected their life and the family and the farms began to, to show signs of what, you know, the loss of hope for the future. So I suppose it kind of comes down to this, that in fact that it was, um, it was during this time of testing, this is what happens when you get tested in your life truly makes the difference of what you're going to read. The simple fact is that we do not always see what the hand of God is doing in our lives at that time. We don't. I remember telling Jackie I was going to pay the house off. And I said, and this was, year, this was a long, pretty good while back. And we had uh, made a decision one time. We didn't know I was really doing a lot of money. I, a lot of houses, I didn't have enough money to keep those, to carry those, those jobs. And so we took a line of credit out on our house, and I thought, well, we'll put it right back in. and Because once I get the house done and get them ready, then I'll have the money and put it right back in. So I, I took out $175,000 on our house, and we didn't owe a lot, but it ended up being about $225,000 on the loan total. And when the house uh, market crashed, I didn't get my money. So I was stuck with $225,000 mortgage on my home when I really only had about $60,000 on it originally. And I know how important it is to have a home. And I know also how important it is to be out of debt that God wants us to be. And in the natural, it looks impossible. But in my spirit, I would say, I'm going to pay that house off. It didn't matter what it looked like. I kept saying, I'm going to pay this house off. I'm going to pay this house off. And... and you know, most people would look at, well, how are you going to do that? What are you going to do? How are you going to pay that off? I said, I don't know how I'm going to pay it off. See, you don't have to know everything. You just have to know that you trust God. And I said, look, I don't know how I'm going to pay it off, but I know this, I'm going to pay it off. I'm going to pay that house off. And then came a hurricane. <laughs> and then, then the mortgage, there went the mortgage. We were... We're able to pay it off. We held off on a little bit, but that's for a reason. There's a technical reason for that. I'm doing taxes and different things. But virtually, we, we paid $225,000 down to nothing, hardly. Because God provided in a strange way. How was I supposed to know there was a hurricane going to come? How was I supposed to know that everything was going to I didn't. I just know we were going to pay the house off. And sometimes when you go through these tough times, you just feel like giving it. Because there were several times that, that I was being, you know, questioned about whether we, well, maybe we need to sell the house. Maybe we need to, I'm not selling this house. I don't want to sell this house. No faith for the future, no power in the present. See, but if we can become sensitive to who? To God's nature, how he does things. 
Walk after the Spirit. We, can, we, will, we will continue to plan for our tomorrow. That's what we do. We don't need to say we're not. We're just, see, he said, you don't have to have any word to, to, to deal with today what today is because today, today has enough troubles in its own self, does it not? Okay. But that does not mean that you can't hope for the future. It does not mean that you don't have to hope for the future. See, we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We're not certain of that. We do know this. It's not going to lead us. Tomorrow's not going to lead us. God's going to lead us. See, we're going to have power today. If we have power today, then we will have power for the future. There's an interesting passage of Scripture, and I'm almost done, that's found in the book of Jeremiah. You need to go to that, Jeremiah 32, 1 through 5. It's during one of the lowest points in history of the children of Israel, just to kind of set the scene, I want to remind you that when this takes place, the Scripture set the scene of captivity of God's people for 70 years. Jeremiah says this in verse 1, chapter 32. The word that came to Jeremiah. Now this is going to be kind of, you're going to have to follow this. This is a little bit tougher, but when you follow it and you get to the end, you're going to see, oh, wow. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, you can say Zedekiah or Zedekiah. I like Zedekiah. King of Judea, of Judah, I'm sorry, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. I know that one. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, 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 Nebuchadnezzar. I got it. Now at that time, the army of the king of Babylon was, be, uh, was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet, keep that in mind, Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard which was in the house of the king of Judah. So he was in prison. Verse 3. For Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, had looked him up, no, wait a minute, had locked him up, saying, why do you prophesy disaster and say, so, so Zedekiah is saying, hey, why do, why do you prophesy this disaster, saying, uh, uh, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, will not... See, he, he's continually telling him, what, This is what you're telling me. This is what you're saying. I'm repeating it back to you. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, will not escape from the hand of the Chaldeans, but he will surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon... And he will speak with his face to speak with him face to face and see him eye to eye, eyeball to eyeball. And he will lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and, and, and he will be there until I visit with him for, for the evaluation and judgment, says the Lord. If you and the, if you fight against the Chaldeans, you, will you not succeed? It's a question mark. So here he is in the face of this disparaging news, what God is doing and saying to his prophet Jeremiah. Look at now, Jeremiah, go down, we're going to go to 6. Jeremiah 32, 6. And Jeremiah answered the king, Zedekiah, and said, so he asked that question, why are you saying all this stuff about, why are you prophesying, why are you saying about this Lord? Are you going to, I mean, come on. And then he looked at the king and he said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, behold, listen carefully. Now, now the, the Lord is talking to Jeremiah and he's saying, listen carefully. Behold, listen carefully. Hannibal, the son of Salom, Shalom, your uncle is coming to you saying, buy my field, that is Anethioth, for you have the right to of redemption to buy it in accordance with the law. And I'm going to read that law to you in a minute, but in accordance to the law. Then Hamno, Hanimo, my uncle's son, that's his uncle's son, 
came to me in the court of the guard. He was still locked up in accordance with the word of the Lord. And he said to me, please buy my field, asking Jeremiah, buy my field that is at the uh, Anathoth, which is in the land of Benjamin, for you have the right of inheritance, huh, come on, and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. I bought the field that was in the Anathoth for Hannibal, my uncle's son. They're detailing this. And weighed out the money for him, 17 shackles of silver. I signed the deed and sealed it. I called in witnesses and weighed out the money on the scales. So I took the deeds of the purchase, both the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions and the unsealed copy. And I gave the purchase deed to Barach, the son of Nerehi, the son of Malsei, in the sight of Hanamel, my uncle's son, and in the sight of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed in the presence of all the Jews who were sitting in the court of the guard. They were all around me when I did all this. I commanded Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this purchase deed, which is sealed, and this unsealed deed, and put them in earthen jars that they may last a long time. See, sometimes you have to just plant your seed and put it where it needs to be, and this might take a long time. It, it, it took a long time to pay this house off. I could have paid this house off three times, but I, I, I took the money and did stuff with it that I didn't, should have done that I didn't do. I took this money that I shouldn't have done that I didn't do. Basically, I took this money that I could have paid it off two or three times, and I blew it. <laughs> And I didn't put it where it should have been. But God is merciful. And he knows your heart and your desires. And he wants to give them to you. But he wants you to give him your heart. So, where am I? And the president said, okay, earthen jars that they may last a long time. So listen to the law that directs. I was going to tell you about the law. Leviticus 25, 25. Okay, and it says, If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor, he has to sell some of the property, then his nearest relative is to come and buy back, redeem that his relative has sold. It is really kind of strange of all that, that he would buy a piece of land for Jeremiah to buy this piece of land when in, in, in himself, he knew, he already knew, he was prophesied that the whole land, that it was going to be laid waste. Yeah. It was. Babylonians were going to take it, they were going to tear it up, they were going to lay it waste. And it was going to fall into the hands of the Chaldeans. And then what good would, it, would this do to him? Why should I buy this desolate land? But it was, but it, it was the will of God and, and, uh, that he should buy it. And he submitted. Though the money seemed to be really thrown away out the window... Look like I'm just throwing this money away. But I'm submitting to what God told me to do. And, and his kinsmen came to offer it to him, and it was not of his own seat. He didn't go after it. He didn't see it and say, I want that. That's what I did with some of the money. I said, I want, oh, I want that. I, want, I, want, I get that. I want that. And, and, you know, when he got down to it, it probably would have went for a pretty good bargain. Because, I mean, when you see it, the, you know, he didn't have a lot. Jeremiah didn't have a lot of money. I don't think he had a lot of money. But what he did have, he was willing to, to lay it out. That's a big deal. Sometimes this might be, man, this is going to squeeze us a little tight to do this. But it's the right thing. To go. I believe the Lord's telling me to do this. See, he, he gave this money out. He laid out this money in such a manner to do the most. He did the most to honor God. He wanted to honor God no matter what. He didn't, it was, I, the money don't mean anything to me now. I don't care about this money. I'm going to do what God says for me to do. 
And he don't care. And, and the good of his friends and his countrymen. Which he preferred before his own private interest. Right? That's not easy. What's in it for me? Most people, right? I'm, I'm, I'm that way. What's in it for me? Am I the only one? Am I the only one? No, oh, I'm looking for a deal. I'm going to try to get a deal, right? But there's times where it's, just, it's not about the money. It's not about the deal. It's about what God wants you to do. So what was the design of having this bargain, this, this deal? What was, the, what was the deal? It was really to signify that through Jer though Jerusalem, I should say, was now being besieged, the whole country was likely to be laid to waste, that the time should come, here's what the Lord said, when the time should come when houses and fields and vineyards should be uh, again possessed in the land. Let's look at Jeremiah 32, 15. Jeremiah 32, 15, it says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards will again be purchased in this land. God knows everything about everything and about every time and when it's going to be. Can we believe him for it? Can we believe him for a future that we don't have any clue of what's going on? Because we can just trust that he has our best interests at heart. He loves us to the point like we're his children, like your children, your grandchildren. You love them. He even loves them more. Even when they don't love you, you still love them. But God, he said, I loved you first. So God, having promised that this land should again come into the possession of his people, Jeremiah will, on behalf of his heirs, put it, in, put it for a share, put in for a share. I'm going to buy some of this land like God said to do. It is a good, it is good. Even This is what we need to do. We need to manage our affairs, our worldly affairs in faith. That's what we need to do. We need to do things in faith even in our worldly stuff that we got going on. Because this was just worldly stuff. But God still had a reason for it. He wanted to keep his people and give his people that he said he would give them. We need to look at doing business the way God wants to do it for our lives. See, the capture of Jerusalem found uh, Jeremiah. He was in prison for what? For what? For being, <laughs> to having faithfulness. And even when he had to announce this coming ruin of this whole thing, I'm going to be, I'm, hey, I'm in prison. They got me in here for this reason, just because I said something out my mouth. Are they doing that today? You don't say something politically correct, ah, you're out. You're cut off. Put them in jail. We got January 6th people still in jail. This is ridiculous. They haven't even been sentenced or tried. So he, they, he's announcing this pending desolation. He announced with the same firm faith as formerly the judgment upon Israel, not only the terrible doom that would overtake, but also the certain restoration of Israel. That's what he did. And in this inspiring confidence of this event, he brought, he bought while in possession a field, as it were, in anticipation of the return of his people to their own land. This was in anticipation. He knew it was coming. This is it. We're done. Jeremiah 32. Hang with me. Jeremiah 32, 37, it says this. Behold, and this is, we're going to go to 44. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries to which I have driven. This is the promise God said about this land that he bought. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries to which I have driven them out in my anger. Oh, you learn your lesson after that. In my wrath and in the great indignation, and I will bring them back to this place and make them live in safety. They will be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may reverently fear me forever for their own good and for the good of their children after them. 
I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will do them good and not turn away from them. And I will put in their heart a fear and reverential awe of me so that they will not turn away from me. I will rejoice over them to do them good. He wants to do us good. And I will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and all my soul. Come on, all my heart and all my soul. We're talking God saying all my heart, all my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great disaster on on this people, so I am going to bring on them all the good that I am promising them. Come on. Fields will be bought in this land of which you say it is desolation, it is desolate, without man or animal. It is given un- into the hands of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans. People will buy fields for money, sign deeds, listen to this, seal them, and call in witnesses in the land of Benjamin, in the place around Jerusalem, in the city of Judea, in the city of the hill country. He's remember he named all that stuff. In the city of the lowland. In the city of the south of Negev, for I will restore their fortune and release them from the exile, says the Lord. He laid out this whole plan and purpose. He told, this is the land mass that you're going to have. From here to here to here to here to here to here. It's all desolate, but it's yours. You're going to take possession of this. And look at where it's at now. Everybody's wanting that peace. See, what God said he, he, he will do, he has done. We must move in faith every day, every, even though the fight against us, the adversities and the conditions that we are in our country of the United States of America, they might look bad, but I'm going to tell you what. I want to have faith for the future and have power in the present. Can I get an amen? Well, let's pray for our nation right now. I'm going to pray this word of Psalms 27, 2, 3. It says, when the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though an army encamped against me, my heart will not fear. Fear not. Though war arise against me, even in this I am confident. Father, we thank you. God, we... We want, when your scripture says, let God arise and let your enemies of this nation be scattered, this is what we're asking in Jesus' name. You are Lord, you are our commander and the chief of the heavenly host, you are. Grant favor to our armed forces that you have given to us to represent you, to guard our freedom and to stand against the acts of terrorism and violence, Lord, that we see in this country and we see all around the world. We want you to be their confidence, and their rear guard. We ask all of this according to your word, that it shall be so. And when we say amen, we mean so be it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I just preach myself happy. (laughs) What a word. here today and you've lost hope for the future if you just looked at it from a standpoint that it looks like it's just impossible the hope is he's coming we don't know when and he says until he comes we're to occupy we're going to occupy this land we're going to pray for this country We're going to believe God for the future. We're going to operate in the presence with power and authority. We're not going to lose heart. We're going to stay steadfast in our our confession, in our faith, in our words. We will stop speaking negatives out of our mouth. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Faith comes from hearing the word. Faith without works is dead. Father, we ask that you help us in our walk with you.
trim us, us, prune us, bring us to a place of strength that we can say in 45 years or however long, we can take this mountain in Jesus' name. We can take this mountain. What mountain? The mountain of all kinds of despair, of lack, of no vision, of no purpose. This mountain of depression. Mountain of sickness that tries to come. Father, we come against the enemy that would try to steal, kill, and destroy from your people. We call out to the angels of God that you've given us as ministering spirits on our behalf to go forth and to minister. We call them out. We say our faith is in God and God alone. Jesus Christ has given us that opportunity because we can walk upright before him, right standing, righteousness before him because not all righteousness but through the righteousness of Jesus Christ who shed his blood on the cross for our salvation. We claim that salvation of healing, salvation of deliverance, salvation of being in heaven. We claim it now in Jesus' name. Help us to love you, God, with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and strength, like you said in your word that you were doing for your people. That is so amazing. So let's worship him now in this final song and know that it's been good to be in the house of the Lord and that we woke up this morning and we have another shot at it. Let's make a mark on this earth today. Let's make it, let's make it, let's make it. Let's change the atmosphere around us as we go. Let's be a witness, a good witness to all those that we come in contact with. Hallelujah. So would you come and move? 